pledge is a natural treat. Oh, for your garden blossoms blooming soil sweet. So come on, join us. You will enjoy it. You'll stay informed when you are gardening with hope. Welcome to Hope for Your Garden. I'm your host, Hope Merkel and I hope to bring you hope for your garden. I hope in the next half hour you learn something, whether you're a complete beginner or an expert, and I hope that you enjoy the show. So now that we're into fall, it's a great time to start planting. Because the soil is warm from summer and the air temperatures are starting to get cooler, it's just such a good time. The, the roots will get established and then the the plant come in the spring will just start to bloom out and become beautiful. Also because we have the winter rains that will come and rainwater almost works like a fertilizer. So that coupled with the warm soil makes fall just a great time to plant. Today I'm going to be talking about a few of my favorites. Hydrangeas, azaleas, camellias, fuchsia begonias, and one of the newer plants to the shade garden, iachromas. Hydrangeas are a plant that's native to northeastern United States, but they do very well here along the coast, and they do well all over California. Uh, they'll take quite a bit of shade, but they'll also take some sun. They can take almost half a day of sun here along the coast and in our San Luis County area. Uh, there's quite a few different kinds of hydrangeas. You have your regular standard hydrangeas, your, your colors, blues, whites, pinks, reds, and then you have miniature varieties of hydrangeas where the flowers stay miniature. The plant actually will stay the same size. Um, you have this behind me is a lace cap and then you have oak leaf, variegated, but they all require pretty much the same care. And that you want your soil to be between a 6.5 and a 7 pH. Some varieties of the pinks will only go to certain shades of purple. They won't turn to a true blue. One of the products that you can use is aluminum sulfate to get your azaleas to the bluer purple side and um, you, you want to use it very sparingly because it can burn. So you put a little bit on and you do it monthly until you reach the color that you need. You need to start doing this about six months before your plants are in bloom or you're going to have to wait till the next bloom cycle before they'll actually color out to the, to the bluer side. If the colors on your hydrangeas seem to be fading and just not keeping that really vibrant color, then you would be wanting to use the superphosphate, and that'll make your colors brighter. That's actually a food. That's, that's high potassium, um, high phosphate. The true blue or the, the aluminum sulfate foods, that's actually an acidifier and not a food. So you want to use it with some of your other fertilizers, um, like a, a good all-purpose fertilizer or an acid fertilizer, like an azalea camellia fertilizer. Two of my favorite planting mixes for azaleas and camellias and all your acid-loving plants are is the Fermulch and the Organic Azalea Camellia Planting Mix and they're a 6.5 pH. Um, they have extra organic material added and they'll keep your soil nice and acid and they're just an excellent addition to our sandy soil, our clay soil, anywhere where you would be planting the azaleas and camellias. Azaleas and camellias need a lot of organic material in the soil. They like really rich soil and so if you have azaleas and camellias and hydrangeas in your yard, it's a really good time of year to go ahead and mulch around them to add organic material. You can add these, you could add bark or humus, but now's a really good time to top dress them and to go ahead and feed them. So you can use these. The shredded redwood is also an extra special one for adding moisture and keeping the soil lightly acid. 
Um, but azaleas, camellias, and hydrangeas all like really rich soil. And so if yours aren't looking optimum, this would be a great, great enhancer. Azaleas are another drought tolerant shade plant that do really well along the coast and in our area. They're native to northeastern uh, United States, but they are another plant that will grow almost in any climate in any region. Azaleas are one that you would want to go ahead and feed with a slow release nitrogen fertilizer and you would want to feed them from about February all the way up until when they come into bloom which is normally going to be about November, December, January and at that time you don't feed them and you let them have a resting period and then again when they stop blooming in the spring you'll go ahead and cut them back and feed them again and get them ready to bloom next year. You do want to mulch them, so you'd want to use another azalea camellia mulch. Um, dig the hole about twice the size of the root ball and then plant them so that they have a nice amount of mulch with them. They also, they like the rich soil so you can top dress with um, bark or like just the shredded bark or top dress with the mulch at least once a year. You're also going to want to feed a slow release nitrogen fertilizer from about February through to September. And then in September, you want to give them a nice push for food and use some superphosphate or even a 01010 would be great. And then when they start to come into bloom, you're going to stop feeding and let them have a rest period. That's kind of when they're dormant. If you continue to feed them, you won't get the blooms that you would normally get. Camellias are actually dormant during their bloom season and that's one of the best times to buy them is when they're actually dormant. You'll do less damage to the roots and you don't have to worry about the blooms falling off They'll, because they're pretty much asleep. And so that's an excellent time. It's, a, it's about November through early spring, early March when that's the time that you should be planting and buying your camellias. When you're feeding your camellias, you're going to want to feed a high nitrogen, slow release fertilizer through February to September. And then in September, you're going to want to switch and use superphosphate. And that will give them that kick that they need to really put out nice blooms. Azalea and camellias like good draining soil and that's what we have here but it doesn't usually have enough organic material in it or mulch to really give them the nutrients that they like and to hold the excess water that they need so putting a layer of camellia azalea garden mix or fur mulch or a good planting mix on top followed with a little bit of bark will give them that richness that they need uh, azaleas and camellias need water accessibility and fertilizer accessibility to give you the blooms and the growth that you need year round. One of the most asked questions that I get about uh, uh, camellias is why do my buds not open up and fall off? The two most popular reasons for that would be not enough potassium and phosphate in the, in the ground during the year while they're, while they're setting and making their buds. And the other one is a little insect called thrip. And that will get in there when the buds are forming and it sucks on the chromosomes inside and destroys those. And then they never fully reach their, their budding stage and they just end up falling off before they open up. So you can spray Volk oil is excellent for thrip or spinosad is another one. And that's an excellent way. If you do it right when the buds are setting, uh, you won't have that problem. This is one of my new favorite plants for shade areas. It's an Iachroma and they've become popular over the last couple of years. The orange Iachroma was probably the first out on the market um, and available, readily available. The purple has become the popular, popular plant. This one's very available and these have become a little bit harder. This rare red is, um, I heard, gonna actually come out next year, so we should be able to get these. Um, they're truly amazing. The more you cut on them, the bushier they get. They can get, oh, upwards of 12 feet if allowed to grow up into a tree, or you can cut them back. And this is one year's, about a year's growth from last winter. 
and they just they get full nice they'll take ocean wind I've seen them 10 feet from the ocean in Morrow Bay just growing beautifully with very little care they do like water so they are a little bit tropical in that sense but they will add just a really full lush thickness to the garden and absolutely beautiful as a small patio tree or a little shade tree in the garden. The hummingbirds love them and they're pretty, pretty uh, insect resistant and the snails don't even seem to bother them. I thought I would bring you out to our local bedding plant growers and show you how the little onion starts and vegetable starts that you'll get for fall are are produced. So these are the little seedling trays that the growers prepare. There's about 500 plants and they're each individually seeded out, little clusters. These are little green onions. And so then they can be taken out and there's their little root structure. You can even see the little onion seeds on the top. And these are then plugged into six packs and four packs and then sold at the nursery. Some of the wonderful vegetables that will be coming out for fall will be red kale, collards, green kale, le red, red sales lettuce, and we have broccoli, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts, cabbage, and um, we have cauliflower, and these are all great things to do by uh, seedling size or to go ahead and put them out as four packs into the garden. Now I'm going to take you down and show you some of the four packs and tell you a little bit more about each plant. So these are how the little veggie packs are sold. They're sold in little four packs and this is an excellent way to get started in the garden and to plant these out at this stage reduces your your damage to the roots and allows for your plant to develop nicely and to produce lots and lots of vegetables. This is uh, broccoli and then down here we have all kinds of different lettuces, cabbage, kales, all getting ready to be shipped out. Now that we're into fall planting season, there's going to be all kinds of vegetables that will be readily available to plant from the little uh, four pack cabbage, cauliflower, kale, lettuce will be available and also all the seeds and a lot of the veggies do really well from seeds especially the beets, all your root veggies, beets, onions, carrots. One of my favorite ways to plant vegetables from seed is to use the seed tapes. They're expensive and harder to find usually you have to mail order them and so I figured out a way to make my very own seed tape. And I'm going to share with you that recipe. First, you just take plain newspaper and you cut about three quarter of an inch strips. And then you decide on which veggies you're going to use. And um, you would plant, space those, like the beets, three inches apart. And so then you go ahead and mark on your newspaper the three inch apart mark and I've already done that on this one. You'll also want to use just the plain black and white newspaper and not use the colored newspaper. The ink on the colored is not good for you so you'd want to just stick with the black and white. And then you go ahead and take out your seed and the beet seeds are nice. They're a little bit bigger and so they're um, easy. Actually the carrots they all work pretty easily and you just go ahead and you put those on your mark and then about every for these every three inches and this will give you perfect spacing so that you don't have to thin out your seed so with a little bit of time you save yourself going out there and trying to pull out all the little seeds. So your seeds will go farther plus you get beautiful straight rows. It just makes fun and it's actually a fun one to do with the kids on rainy days when you can't go out in the garden. 
and then you just want to mix up a little um, edible glue basically. This is flour and water and I've used about a heaping teaspoon of flour to a teaspoon of water. And you want to use cold water because it'll mix up nicer. And then I let it sit for about five minutes while I'm doing the other and it seems to come out a really nice texture. Then you just scoop up, you could use a spoon or any little thing and then you just put enough on the top of that seed uh, to kind of cover and hold it to the um, paper. You could even put the seed down and then put the put the glue down and put the seed on top for the bigger seeds. Sometimes the little seed it becomes easier to put the seed down and the glue over the top but on these big ones you can even do it the opposite way. So I'll just go along there and finish up my last seed. I can get one on the end here. And then you want to let this dry for a few hours to even overnight. And then what you end up with is this. And this you can see I did the other way where I went over the top. And then I've marked these so I know that they're beets and that they need to be planted a half inch deep. And so I like to mark that on the containers. And then, so you can do these anytime pre ahead, they'll keep for months. And then you just roll them up. And I like to keep mine in a Ziploc bag with a little pouch of um, powdered milk. And that will keep the moisture from going to the seeds so that they don't sprout. It keeps them nice and dry. And so then I just put them in here mark what they are and then I'm ready to plant. You can even put your empty seed package in here in the Ziploc bag so you know exactly what they are so you have this to label in the garden. A lot of people ask me how do they tell if their seed is viable and still good after they've had it over a year. So if you take your seed and put it in a little glass of water Anything that floats to the top is not good, and anything that sinks to the bottom would still be good. So now that it's fall and time to plant, the cyclamen are coming into season. And so I brought you out to May Floral. And this is Kyle May, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the cyclamen. Well, the uh, cyclamen are a winter-fall crop that... Um, comes in every fall and goes through the spring. Um, they're a little different than most of the other plants that we have here. Um, they really, really enjoy the cold, which makes, um, they actually enjoy it more um, chilly than really warm. When you get the hot days, they'll actually start to get gummy. Um, and then as it cools down, they tighten up. Some of them have uh, fragrance. You'll notice some of the whites will have a little bit more of a strong fragrance. The colored uh, ones have a little bit more tendency to not have so much. If you could actually smell it in here, there is, uh, from the mum house, as you walk in, you'll notice that uh, there is a... Like jasmine. Yeah, all of a sudden it'll, it'll pop in. And as the whole greenhouses get filled up, it even um, gets more flagrant through the whole thing. Um, absolutely wonderful in here. It's it smells like candy. <laughs> it's a little different than jasmine. It's a little sweeter. So the the um, on the planting, they're a they're a bulb actually, or a tuber. <laughs> a tuber, yeah. And so they like to be planted a little bit higher in the ground when people plant. Yeah. Um, the uh, the most important thing with them is is to go ahead and get them in a shady area. In Los Sosos, if you're on the coast, you can go ahead and get away with a little more light just because we get a lot of fog and it gets, stays cooler. If you're inland, you want to get them underneath a tree because once the summer months come around, they're going to have a really hard time. They'll, okay. they'll go down, they'll um, kind of come down just to where they have a few, um, few leaves here and there. But moderate watering, I mean, you don't have to 
get a ton of water on them. I'd say when moist, you're moist but not wet. Moist, yeah, moist but not wet. If you some people have a tendency to overwater them. Well, what happened then is when the um, if you look at the bottom of the pot here, it will it will start to actually have a, a wet texture to it rather than just a kind of nice moist damp. or to, yeah damp where the the roots can soak up the water but not have it um, wet have it yeah because then you'll get um, disease and stuff starting to grow in there and then it'll, it'll end up killing the um, the bulb the and the whole thing and nice <laughs> they're absolutely gorgeous so I've come back with a few gorgeous cyclamen from the May greenhouse and. They're just super easy to plant. They go all winter long. They'll go through the rain, the winter. Being outside, you don't have to cover them or worry about those cold nights. The colder it gets, the better they do. So I'm just gonna put one in a pot to put on my front doorstep. And they're super easy to plant. You would take them out of the pot. And then you can check to see if you see a bulb a lot of times on the older ones, even in the smaller containers, you can actually see the bulb that they grow from on the more mature plants. And that bulb you want to keep above soil level, so you don't want to bury it or it, it will rot. But these you would just bury at just soil level, even with the soil that's in the pot, or just slightly above. And so I'm going to get a little bit of soil in my pot. And I'm using the green all potting soil, which is a really nice, even pH, um, and just makes it really easy to plant and things do exceptional in. And I've had such good luck with this that it's one of my favorite potting soils. So I'm just gonna get that about halfway full. I'm gonna still want to have a about a half inch to an inch uh, lip so that when I water it, I, it won't just be running over. And then I'm just going to so do a little measurement there. And that's right about right. And you could also mix the cyclamen with other shade plants. And then that way, in the spring, when the cyclamen die out, you have other plants that would stay on. Um, if it's not full, full shade, Bacopa is a beautiful one to put in these because then you get the white cascade over the side. Begonias are gorgeous with cyclamen. And even Impatience, those are excellent. And then you just want to gently tuck the soil in and around. And then I'll give this a good watering, and that's it. The sapote trees get really big, so you would want to make sure that you have enough space to plant, but it's an excellent time of year to plant fruit trees. You do want to make sure that if you're planting a large tree, this one will get 50 feet tall, that you're not under a telephone wire or any type of power lines, because it'll make trimming difficult and it can cause a lot of problems later on when it, when it does get that high. So to plant my sapote tree, I'm going to dig my hole. Um, I'm gonna go about double the root ball size and because I'm next to an open field here, I'm gonna put a gopher cage in because the gophers would like the sapotes as much as we do. And when you're carrying your trees, bringing them in and to back and forth from the car to the, from the nursery, you don't wanna grab the stalk, you always want to grab the pot because you can actually do a lot of root damage by pulling this out and then I'll show you how to gently slide it out to put it into the ground. I'm going to dig my hole. Okay, now I have my hole dug and it's a little bit bigger than my gopher cage and so now I'm going to add one of my favorite soils and that's the fir mulch and it's a fir bark that's been soaked in a 15% chicken manure solution and then they add all kinds of wonderful ingredients like bat guano, earthworm castings, feather meal, kelp meal, and it just makes a great home for your new plant. These are great. These are the gopher cages that are already pre-made. And so then you just press them apart and you don't end up getting stuck having to clip and cut and wire together the cages. And they're pretty inexpensive pretty reasonably. 
I think this one was right around five dollars. So I'm going to add a little bit of soil just to fill to the bottom of the cage. And again, if I had smell a vision, you could smell how rich this is. And so now what I'm going to do is just kind of slide tipping almost upside down. If you give it a nice squeeze, it should just roll right out. There we go. Just slide that right in. You want to make sure that the soil level is level with where your old soil is going to be. So this I'm going to need to bring up a little bit. And I can do that after I get a little bit of soil in there. To kind of gauge where your soil is going to be, if you take the end of your shovel, lay it across your hole, it'll give you a good idea of about where you need to be. You can even use your empty can as your guide to see where you need to place your first mound of soil. Go out a little bit. And so you could check it by going that way. So that's about where I'm going to keep my hole. So now I've got it to the level that I want. You really want to go ahead and use a complete bag, uh, about two cubic feet around each plant, because this is going to be its home for a very long time. And unless you're mulching later, um, this is going to be its good start. So if you skimp, it'll be a weaker tree. So, you want to have the gopher cage up as kind of high just so the gophers don't um, end up climbing over, which they've been known to do lately. I'm going to go ahead and tamp this in a little, my foot. You don't need to pack it super heavy, but you do want to get kind of a nice tamp on it. I've got that just above and now I'm going to water it in and then our sapote tree is planted. This tree will produce about a hundred pounds of fruit a year and it's an excellent almost guava like fruit and they're kind of the size they'll get to about the size of a, a large peach and I can't wait. Anytime you plant a plant it should be watered in immediately so that you remove any air pockets and that you don't burn the roots and cause them stress. Well, thank you for joining me today on Hope for Your Garden, and I hope that you found something useful for your garden. And until next time, happy gardening. Sweet. So come on, join us. You will enjoy it. You stay informed when you are gardening. Garden.